yeah, better business mindfully. What does that mean? Well, I wanted to kind of build on uh, the points Gertprit mentioned earlier and hopefully lead into uh, Mark's talk in um, a few moments as well. Um, my experience background, just to touch on briefly, um, yes, I'm passionate about mindfulness and meditation, but I come at it from a background of communications. Um, I actually used to be an engineer and then I moved into communications and been working in comms for 20 years. And core to kind of making this work is both mindset and how you communicate um, um, so on the subject of communication, I'm going to ask you a question and get you thinking um, about how we respond to this. And I invite you to use, use the chat um, and, and share some of your thoughts. Um, and write into the chat a few notes on how you are today. Yeah, so let's just notice for a moment how you are. And it's good to get your thoughts and feelings how you're feeling today and I want you to also notice when you ask that question are you really asking are you really prepared for the answer are you really listening you know, are you saying it going through the motions going back to some of Anne Marie's points about connection about are you being a good colleague uh, one of the things I've found um, that's really powerful for me I don't know if you've noticed that COVID-19 has really changed the way people ask and answer this question and it matters at work um, in my communications work I found I've suddenly made connections with journalists that were so hard before we actually stopped to kind of say how are you how are you really and how are you really affected and it didn't add that much into the time of my working day in actual fact it made conversations more effective it made the business side more human more efficient um, so I just want you to notice and particularly in those first few weeks of lockdown I think a lot of us were very mindful we were really asking that question and really listening and we've perhaps slipped into bad habits um, and slipped back into old ways of doing old ways of being I'm sure some of you will say no absolutely not I'm you know I turned over a new leaf but I just want you to think about that and and notice so what is mindfulness and why does it matter in a business context why should I be mindful at work and I just invite you um, to share for a moment a, a few thoughts in um, in the chat of what mindfulness means to you um, you know actually what what does it mean and what does it mean to be a mindful business I'll start you off if nobody wants to go I'm sure Mark's got lots of ideas now what does it mean to be mindful in the workplace maybe my broadband might be a bit slow so have a little think I'll see what ideas you open up in a moment so Here's a few words to get you think. Mindful business is about being curious, courageous, consistent, kind, values-led, resilient. One of the points that Anne-Marie raised is that point of pausing, stopping the Google, the Apple technique of having a meeting before you begin, kind of encouraging everybody to have that mindful moment, to pause and breathe and exhale and then progress with the meeting um, I've I'm working with a particular client and I've noticed we ask that question how are you guys doing we frame it with something specific around well-being people's tools and we use that in a team meeting and our team meetings have much better connection and they take half an hour less than they did when we were face to face and I know there's online versus face to face things that may be connected to that but actually pausing asking 
considering and listening has really changed things. Mark's going to talk about resilience in a few minutes, so I'll leave most of that to, to him. But I would just touch on this idea of a resilience link to mindfulness and think about some of those businesses and individuals that you know who've proved their resilience at this time. I can think of the great US company um, who used to make bourbon, who then realized that they were going to be locked down they were going to have to furlough or make start a whole massive team redundant and within three days they turned their business around to make hand sanitizer and that's a truly resilient a truly courageous business in adapting in listening um, in being led by that mindful direction um, so yeah there's a lot more to mindfulness than just simply breathing so talking about the resilience you know this idea of bouncing back we also talk about resilience because it's a set of skills that anyone can learn and again I know Mark's going to be talking about this in more detail but what I want to invite you to think about when it comes to resilience is how different we all are. I'm going to talk about the glass versus the table and you can tell from this little sketchy diagram that I used to be an engineer and you know, stress equals force over area. So you know, the, the force that you apply to something and the area over which you apply it will determine whether or not something breaks. So if I stop and I get up and jump on the table here other than sending my papers and cups and laptop flying uh, am I likely to break the table? Actually, like that table bridge that you see on there, it's pretty tough. It's pretty, you might say, resilient. So it probably would cope with me jumping on it. However, if I was to jump on my glass, depending on the angle which I jumped on it, not only would I spill the water everywhere, I'd make a right mess of my bare feet, um, and I would probably smash the glass. However, when we think of people and when we think of businesses, um, we need tables and we need glasses. Uh, let me just explain that a little bit more. My table is rubbish at holding any water and providing a vessel for me to drink from. Does that make it a bad table? This glass may be more likely to smash if I were to jump on it. Does it make it a bad glass? Is, is it awful? Is it ill-equipped for purpose? No, it has the skills, resilience, competences that equips it to be a great vessel for holding my water. And I want to remember you to remember this with people. People have different skills. That's what makes our workplaces so exciting. That's what makes our communities so dynamic. It's those different skills, those different experiences. Um, there was a piece uh, in the New York Times last week that talked about resilience and talked about the incredible level of deep trauma that is held. I'm doing work with a psychotherapy client um, and they've um, found that you know two in five of people who seek psychotherapy do so because of deep-rooted childhood trauma and abuse in their past. Um, so you know, are these people any less capable of doing their job? No, they're just in a different point and resilience can, can help us. Um, Yes, I get, get get your points. We can uh, change our, our resilience. We can uh, you know, strengthen the table. We can make it stronger. We could choose a different device to glass to make it more resilient. Yes, we can do this. But it's not just about sacking your staff because a better one could come along that is more flexible. It's about working out um, the ways to support your team and recognize and honor the skills that that they bring to the party can you be more like a duck a little invitation for you 
this Michael Caine quote. And we were talking the other day how so much of mindfulness is, you know, being like a duck, remaining calm on the surface and paddling like hell underneath. And I just remind you if you suffer at all, uh, like many of us, from some of the anxiety when you see people's perfect LinkedIn pages, perfect Instagram posts, and you think, oh my God, they're coping so much better with lockdown, with this crisis than me. You know, look at their perfect life. Look at that perfect cycling. Look at that perfect, oh my God, they're giving so much more. You know, the guilt that rose with Paul's comments earlier uh, about communities, about not giving enough. It's like, oh my God, I, you know, I haven't done enough to to help you um i i haven't supported you enough community world and then the overwhelm comes and then the the incredible feeling of i'm not good enough and that's not helpful to anybody to be able to to process just remember how many of those people are already like ducks and they are already um get presenting perhaps just one particular perspective of their life. A more mindful approach helps us to see that. So why mindfulness? Why a mindful approach? Mindfulness is to mental health what fitness is to physical health. It, it is a state of being. Um, it's a state of being more aware. It teaches us acceptance. It, not, it isn't just about a breathing technique, although we're going to look at some of those in a minute. It teaches us that thoughts are not fact. No matter how real they seem in our head, um, they are not fact. Um, and it enables us to process the difficult, the complicated, the challenging, to sit with our mistakes and learn from them rather than be a culture of all oh, mistakes are not welcome here. Actually, we need to understand that mistakes are that first attempt in learning um, but processing our thoughts differently um, it's supported by cbt which again is about understanding your thought processes and thought cycles and emotional loops um, nhs endorses and nice guidelines endorse and there's thousands of pieces of scientific research about mindfulness and meditation and how they make a difference to our well-being but also how the approach makes a difference to our business and i'm going to touch specifically on those in a moment first thing i'm going to do is do a little mindfulness exercise and do a three minute check-in with you three minutes to ask the question how are you feeling right now oh, going back to that same question again so you notice the judgments you notice what comes up you notice those queries how am I going to fill them in oh great Judy I can pop to the loo I can go and get a cup of tea that's what I'm going to do with my how am I feeling right now just pause how are you really feeling just taking this moment to become aware of yourself and you can even look away from your screen if you want have a little break for a moment looking around and coming back and reflecting how are you feeling now you can write in the chat if you want to and notice and then we come into our second minute and I ask you again, how are you feeling now? But I invite you to pay particular attentions to how you feel physically. What are the sensations that you are experiencing in your body? Are your shoulders tense? Have you been sat patiently um, as part of this conference since perhaps about quarter to ten did you not get up for a little break are you feeling quite sedentary quite stuck are you feeling that urge to move feeling quite comfortable but oh my shoulders are a bit slumpy I've got zoom neck I'm leading forward how are you feeling physically and again just take another moment to quietly notice and you can appreciate all the physical sensations from your toes, 
up to your bottom, all the way up to your head. And notice those feelings rise and fall. And if you want to, write in the chat the differences when you begin to notice the physical, you can. Moving into our third minute, coming now to a greater awareness of our emotions, of our analytical judgments, our feelings of, okay, right now you've covered this. Yeah, I've done this. I'm bored. Now move on. I'm bored. I'm frustrated. What's coming in? I feel a nagging. I've got this other work to do. Just kind of noticing that battle, that demand, those thoughts calling for your intention. And just invite those thoughts to become like clouds in the sky. Thoughts that come in and pass that you judge less. You just notice you're feeling a little bit frustrated. You're feeling a bit tired. You're feeling ready to move on. And then you just breathe and let that feeling pass. Three minutes of just thinking about that simple question. How are you feeling now? How can mindfulness meditation help? That's a pleasant idea. Yeah, perhaps you feel a little calmer. Perhaps you're noticing those little corrections. How can it really help me at work? And I love these quotes from John Kabat-Zinn. And they, again, make you look at how mindfulness questions your choices, your choices at work, your choices in your relationship. And to notice your reactions and the choices you have to those reactions. And the question that, is there really any waking moment that would not be richer and more alive if you were fully awake while it was happening? I invite you to think about that question in the mindful task, in the task of writing that email, that challenging note that you've got to send to somebody who wrote you something impolite or was a bit rude in a particular session, someone who's wound you up. And if you let that emotion come in the way of your email you will procrastinate before you write it or you'll write it and you'll feel stroppy about the person and some of their that emotion will come across into the way you articulate things a simple task like that email can take much much longer than it really should if you can be very mindful very present and take away as Thich Nhat Hanh said that feeling that this task is a nuisance and do it with openness with curiosity it gets the task done much quicker much cleaner now it doesn't have to be done without compassion without care going back to Anne Marie's point about are you a good colleague it doesn't have to be done rudely but it can be done mindfully and aware of the present doesn't mean it needs to take any longer in actual fact it will probably take less so I just want you to reflect perhaps on a few times when you are mindful in your work and when you're not and notice what happens so you might need this all sounds very nice it sounds quite fluffy how do I actually kind of present a business case to do something at work to take action um, and some of the key factors Gertrude talked about some of them earlier uh, are, are the links between mindfulness and stress the stress the anxiety and depression these are HSE figures before coronavirus and we've seen some of the startling figures um, when you see the 15.4 million days lost to anxiety, stress and depression a year and the cost of 5 billion to the economy, it feels a bit big, it feels a bit intangible. But no matter how big or small your business is, if you start to think about that as the average of nearly 26 days lost per employee that is experiencing these, these stressful symptoms, um, then you really see how much of an impact it has. Even if you're a one-man band, it probably has even more of an impact. And taking practical action can help to make a difference. Stress is also used a little bit as a dirty word. Stress is a state that we all experience stress, and stress is not always a 
bad thing. We come to use stress when we mean high stress, when we mean I'm entering burnout, I'm feeling exhausted. In actual fact, a little bit of stress is is needed. Um, it helps us function well. It helps us work at our peak performance. It sometimes helps us. We look at those resilient companies that I talked about earlier, innovate, rise to the challenges and, and come up with new solutions. It stops us being in that point of inactivity. Um, but the inactivity is just as dangerous as the high stress. Um, I talked earlier about that feeling of guilt and inactivity when Paul started talking about, oh, you know, we're all not doing enough to help the inequalities across Reading. And I can actually feel, instead of feeling I want to take action, I can feel a little bit stuck, a little bit unable to do anything, caught in that lameness. And I think a lot of people, a lot of a businesses are caught in such such an odd level of stress where they're actually incapable of action and not they've forgotten how to use stress um, to work for them and and to recognize you know the value of this um, part of our human bodies that enabled us and our ancestors to survive to run away from the big bear to fight off the warring tribe some other science that links to mindfulness. Um, Killingsworth and Gilbert produced a wonderful study about the wandering mind. So while you've been listening to me, um, most of you, sorry to be unkind, um, are probably pretty average. And therefore, you being average, you've be only been paying attention to me 49% of the time, if I'm lucky. You've really not been listening. You've been doing other things. I see a few people laughing there. And that is normal. That is average. So you may kind of go, oh, sorry, Judy, I'm way below average. I haven't been listening to you very much at all. The worst thing about that statistic that they found is that by not paying attention to what's happening in the moment, it actually made us unhappy. 84% of people were less happy by not being present in the moment. So just food for thought. And I invite you to remember the key points in those statistics were that it was about average. We are not average here. We're not average by being at this conference, by being part of the ethical Reading movement. We don't want to be normal. We want to step out of that and we want to focus our wandering mind. By focusing we become happier happy thoughts some of you may have done the interesting things when you uh, explore how much happiness leads to greater strength and physical strength in in your body and it's some something you can try um, probably don't have enough time later but uh, at, at home um, you know, hopefully you have somebody with you if you're isolating on your own you can actually practice this on yourself and you can recall a happy thought and you can invite somebody to do what they call a stress test on you think about a happy thought and you resist kind of your uh, hand moving down as someone tries to push your hand down think of an unhappy thought something that makes you feel sad something that makes you feel a little bit low and do the same and press down and what you notice is that we have greater strength and greater flexibility physically when we have that happiness. That happiness makes us 50% more productive. And if you can use that to get into the state of flow, and you will all have done that at some point, when you kind of feel everything is working for you, everything just sort of clicks, just the work is easy, something that should have taken five hours suddenly takes one, we are literally 200% more productive how wonderful to be able to get into that productive happy focus state and it's not just good for our work it's good for our well-being uh, John Kabat-Zinn who's um, Centre for Mindfulness is situated right next to Massachusetts General Hospital um, has studied over 
literally thousands of different health conditions um, and proven reductions in pain, physical improvements, and how it actually makes the drugs work better. It actually makes the medicines that you take work better because of the way mindfulness works um, to, uh, to trigger new neural pathways in our brain and new connections between the different sides of our brain. So there's a really good business case which we can talk about. Um, I'm actually going to come back to the breath exercise if if we have time because I'm aware we need to be wrapping up. Um, but where do you start? So one thing you can do is yes, you can start by breathing. You can start by practicing noticing by trying to be more mindful. Um, there's some great tools that you can use to help you be more mindful and making that time to evaluate how are you going to then audit the stress within your business, within yourself and determine those success metrics. What does success look like? Um, Ethical Reading can help, you know, the well-being strategy and the tools that, that we have as a team. Anne-Marie's statement about the five ways to well-being is a really good model. There are many others. Mark's going to introduce some others and how the five ways links in into that. It's there, there are lots of different things that can give you the tools. What's important is to build a plan to have a strategy and then think about the communications to share that even if it's just you and your one man band that's communication is how you communicate that to your customers to the communities who whose lives you touch there's loads of development you can do in training and support but the most important thing is to take the first step by giving yourself some time to notice how it feels to be more mindful and to evaluate that that concept, that idea of more mindful work and getting into that state of flow and focus. And if you have a team, giving them that permission um, and realizing, as I'm hoping many of you have realized with the current crisis, that actually it doesn't take any longer. It probably takes less time. So thank you. I'm aware I need to uh, close, but um, um, there's call to action here now from Ethical Reading, you know, invitation on um, you know, how you can act. Um, and uh, hopefully that will be helpful for you. Um, it's been great seeing you all. Um, if you have any questions, really happy um, to answer them on here or um, yeah, get in touch. Um, and I'll just ping my um, email address in the comments so you can drop me a line. Thank you. I'll pass back to GoPro. Super, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Judy. And if you do have questions, if we haven't, um, uh, had time to go through them do put them in the chat window uh, or drop us a, an email and we, we will make sure we'll get back to you and we'll contact Judy and uh, get the responses back to you fabulous